extensions don't matter a whole lot in Linux. However, they do matter for the GUI to some degree. So if I wanted to make this just called test, the graphical interface wouldn't know what it was. However, I could still execute a bash script from the command line called test. So it's, the program is still understood. But I would go ahead and use best practice and put file extensions on things the way they're supposed to be. Also, if you ever downloaded a file from the internet and it was called this, now we have test. Well, it doesn't know what to do with it, but what if it was a PNG file? It was a We knew that, but it didn't properly download that way. I could move test to test.png, and now it would be recognized as a PNG file by our photo viewer. Little tips and tricks. So, what if we wanted to put something in this guy? So, there's two major options that you'll find on most Linux distributions, and I'm going to cover those. There's a lot of other ones. There's Emacs, there's Vim, there's all sorts of them, but I'm going to show two, because one of these two will almost certainly be on your system by default. One of them is Nano, and I think it's the easiest to learn. And in Nano, we have this nice little interface here, so I'm going to write a program while I'm in here. I'm going to write hello cat. And I'm writing cat because I'm going to change it on purpose. Basically, the way you work, this little caret here means the control key, and then you use the corresponding letter to do whatever you wanted. So you can search for something in it, you can cut text. What I want to do is I want to write out, I want to save the file. So I'll do control O and hit enter. I can change the file name there too, you see. And then I can control X right here, and then I can close it out of nano. Now what if I wanted to have a look at that real quick? Well, I can cat it. There you go. It's showing me what's in the program. I could also use a program called less. Less basically is nice because it lets you scroll through. And the way you quit is by typing colon Q. And it will take you out of less. There's another command that's useful called tail. And this is if you have a really, really big file and you just want to look at the end of it. If you're looking at a log, this is a good one. So this will show the same thing that cat does. But if we had 7,000 lines, it would show us, I believe, the last five lines of that 7,000. The nice thing about this, 7,000 lines takes a long time to load, but five lines doesn't. So tail can give you the last little bit. Finally, I want to teach touch. Touch allows you to create files without actually having to interact with them. So touch, I just made a file. I don't want it. Let's remove it. Here's another one you need to know, rm for remove. So two things about rm that are the most important. This will delete the file. Let's go ahead and make a folder with another command. Okay, dir, make directory. We're going to call that folder test. So what if we wanted to remove it? We'll do rm-r now. The r stands for recursive, and this says delete everything in here. And also go ahead and delete this file. So this will delete both of those. And they're gone. And I don't know if you saw them appear and disappear here, but they did. You see this has a different icon now because we called it .sh, and now it realizes that this is a program. So I showed you nano, I showed you removing things, I showed you making a folder. So I want to show you the other text editor that might come default on your system, and that's called VI. So VI is considerably harder to use. If you have nano and you're just getting started, VI, avoid it if you can, but you may have to use it depending on what you're using. You might not have nano available to you. So VI is real old school. And you might notice, hey, it's actually kind of prettier than nano, and that's true, I agree. But it's also really confusing to use. So in order to edit this, I actually have to hit I on my keyboard. Now I can move my cursor, and I can edit just like I would normally. So there we go. And now I want to save this. So I've written Hello World a bunch of times. I've basically written my program, and I'm ready to save. So I hit Escape, and I'm still in here. I can move the cursor around, but I actually can't type now. What I would do is then hit colon, W for write, and Q for quit. So you see those down here in the corner. So after I've hit escape, I hit colon W Q. I hit enter and it will write and quit the program. Now I'll cat that test file. You see there's my program. And that's how you use VI. VI is a little bit more complicated. So we've written a basic program. We've gone from how do you even move around the terminal to writing a program in it. Well, they're not very far from one another. There's not a lot you have to know to get started. There is one last thing you need to know, though, and that's how to make your program execute. Well, you could do this. 
you can type bash and then type your script. This tells the computer, hey, this is the bash programming language and I want you to execute this file with the bash programming language. That does work. There's other ways to do it though. And one of them is by using the chmod command. I'm going to do something bad and I'm going to explain why it's bad. So I did 777 and now I should be able to. So the dot slash is the universal symbol for execute this file. I can use this once it's been made executable because the computer knows what to do with it already because I used the chmod command. Now this does work. I use chmod 777 test.sh. Don't use 777. It's super, super insecure. What we've done is by using that 777, these are our permissions, we've given myself read, write, execute, the group read, write, execute, and the computer read, write, execute. Anyone who gets on this computer can execute this program with absolutely no elevation at all or anything. That's kind of dumb. They can also delete it, which is probably the biggest one that's the of most concern. So when I see 777, I'm at least inclined to do this. And now if we look at that again, you see that I've, I've taken the executability away. So all they can do is possibly delete or read it. This is not even that secure to my liking, but I would at least do this. Star 774. I'll show you the difference there. Now all the computer itself can do is read, but the group can read, write, execute. Now, these numbers correspond to these groups of three, so if I wanted to make everyone only able to read it, I could do 444. Four, four. And now you see they all can read. If I wanted myself to have everything and everyone else to only be able to read, I would do 744. Four. Now there's cheat sheets for this online, but it's really not super hard to figure it out once you just play with it a little bit. And actually, you could honestly just play with it a little bit. There's only seven digits, and you don't have to figure out all three digits. You only need to figure out each one, because each digit corresponds to a group of a, a group of characters here, as opposed to it being some complicated binary thing. I'm not going to talk about groups today. There's something a little bit more complicated, but I do want to talk a little bit about root. So we've talked about executing programs. We've talked about permissions. Let's talk about root. So this right here says super user do. Super user. Sounds redundant, right? Well, it is kind of redundant. But what it's saying is I want to log in as a root user. And so now you see I was in Gunto. Now I'm root. And you see this also has changed to a pound sign. And also if I hit CD and do PWD to see where I am, the home folder is actually slash root instead of slash home slash Gunto. That's because the root is its own user on the computer and it actually has all the power. So it can do everything and anything, no matter what you've set up, no matter what you've done. Now, this is actually a huge security hole, so most computers won't have a root user. Some of them will, but most of them manage their root with something called a sudoverse file. And basically, it's if you're from Windows or Mac, think of it like an administrator. You have the ability to elevate privileges with sudo as opposed to just having all of the privileges all the time. I'm going to open Nautilus as root. So as root I can go in to the computer and just delete stuff. If I wanted to I could just delete the boot folder and that would be really really bad. And the thing about it that's both cool and dangerous about root is I can actually run programs with all of this ability. So that's actually the purpose of sudo. I can do that for a little while, but then quickly when I don't need it anymore, I can just be a regular user again. So best practice is to use sudo to do root stuff every time. You'll see this in most tutorials, but I, I, I don't know. I'm inclined when I'm in a tutorial actually to go and drop to a, a root shell, but I also won't execute a program by just copying and pasting it from the internet. All right, so this was my crash course in the terminal. I went from the most basic of tasks to writing a small program in it in hopefully not very long. Thank you for watching The Linux Guy. Please subscribe, leave a comment below, and we'll see you in the next one.